A temporary channel is now open at the site of the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Find out more about the progress of the cleanup effort. U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announces a new rule today that will require more personnel to operate freight trains. We'll have the details. The state of Oregon is making certain drugs more illegal again. What the governor says about reinstating penalties for the possession of illegal drugs. Former President Trump is in Michigan this afternoon speaking about the impact of illegal immigration. A new poll shows how many Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of the border crisis. A group of outraged parents take new legal action in the case of an LGBT club for third to sixth graders. Parents say the club was kept secret from them. We'll hear from an attorney representing the group. Severe weather alert. Thunderstorms to intensify, bringing potential for power powerful tornadoes, damaging winds, and large hail across the southeast to Ohio Valley. Welcome to NTD Newsroom. I'm Stephanie Cox. Former President Trump speaking in Michigan this afternoon. He's expected to talk about the ongoing immigration crisis at the event in the swing state. NTD's Arian Pazdar has more. Former President Trump is speaking in Grand Rapids, Michigan this afternoon. His event is called Biden's Border Bloodbath. Now, this name stems from a recent controversy. Media outlets misrepresented a statement made by Trump when he talked about a possible bloodbath in the auto industry. The former president is expected to highlight the killing of a young Michigan woman in his speech today. Police say she was killed by her boyfriend last month. The suspect had previously been deported to Mexico. This comes as immigration is shaping up to be a key issue in this year's presidential election. A new poll by the Associated Press shows that 68 percent of Americans disapprove of the way Biden is handling immigration. Only 31 percent say they approve. And a judge is dismissing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis from a lawsuit. Back in 2022, Florida flew around 50 illegal immigrants from Texas to Martha's Vineyard. Civil rights groups later sued DeSantis, the state of Florida, the company who chartered the flight and others. DeSantis is now dismissed, but litigation continues with the other defendants, such as the charter company. The judge says that they exploited the illegal immigrants in a scheme to help the DeSantis campaign. Arian Pastar, NTD News. In an email statement from ICE today, 215 illegal immigrants face deportation after breaching barriers and clashing with National Guard troops in El Paso on March 21st. We have more updates on the bridge collapse in Baltimore next. The U.S. Coast Guard has opened a temporary altern alternate channel for vessels involved in clearing debris. This channel is on the northeast side of the collapsed bridge. Officials say this is part of a phased approach to opening the main channel leading to the vital port. Crews are removing steel and concrete at the site of the bridge's deadly collapse. And the task can be complicated. Officials say the temporary channel is open only to vessels helping with the cleanup effort. A tugboat pushing a barge for the Defense Department was the first vessel to cross the alternate channel. Two additional larger channels are planned as more debris is removed from the waterway. We're talking about a situation where a portion of the bridge beneath the water has been described by, uni by Unified Command as chaotic wreckage. Every time someone goes in the water, they are taking a risk. Every time we move a piece of the structure, the situation could become even more dangerous. We have to move fast, but we cannot be careless. The owner and manager of the cargo ship that rammed into the Baltimore Bridge aims to limit liability for the deadly disaster. A court filing yesterday seeks to cap the company's liability at just over $43 million. A federal court in Maryland will ultimately decide who is responsible for what could become one of the costliest catastrophes of its kind. President Biden will travel to Baltimore on Friday and is expected to meet with state and local leaders as he tours the damaged area. Maryland Governor Wes Moore explained yesterday the dangers involved in the cleanup effort. And the Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announced today a new rule that will increase the number of freight train crew workers. Major freight railroad companies must now maintain two-person crews on most routes across the U.S. 
Some of these trains running through communities are about three miles long. For perspective, if you put the Empire State Building on its side and then added 11 more Empire State Buildings, that's about how big some of these trains would be. And they want to operate that with one person. It defies common sense, and that changes today. So on behalf of the Biden administration, our department is proud to issue this final rule requiring safe crew sizes for every train across America. Rail unions have long been against one-person freight train crews because of a combination of safety and job concerns. Railroad companies oppose the rule, stating there isn't enough data to suggest that operating a two-person freight train crew is any safer. There is more scrutiny on railroad safety after the fiery train derailment in eastern Ohio in February 2023. At least 11 states have already approved rules requiring two-person crews. And a first-of-its-kind law in the U.S. dealing with illegal drug possession is being reversed. Oregon lawmakers voted to roll back a voter-approved measure. They are making personal use possession back into a misdemeanor, punishable by up to six months in jail. Democratic Governor Tina Kotek signed the new law Monday. 58% of our Oregon voters approved the old law in 2022, but officials haven't fully implemented it. The old law made the personal use possession of illicit drugs such as heroin, cocaine and methamphetamines only punishable by a ticket and a maximum fine of $100. Supporters argue that treatment is better than jail in helping people who are addicted. But it would cost millions of dollars and deadly overdoses have been on the rise. And a federal judge denied a motion to dismiss charges against Hunter Biden for tax evasion. President Biden's son is accused of repeatedly failing to file his taxes on time. Hunter Biden is also accused of filing false returns to avoid paying taxes and falsifying records related to his company's payroll. The charges say Hunter Biden evaded $1.4 million in taxes while allegedly spending money on a lavish lifestyle. The younger Biden has pleaded not guilty to all charges. His attorneys said last month the case was politically motivated and filed several motions to dismiss. However, the judge rejected these claims, saying Biden's lawyers provided no evidence. The case can now go to, it could go to trial in June. A controversial case in California, an LGBT club for third to sixth graders at an elementary school. Parents say the club was kept secret from them. A legal challenge was recently issued on behalf of the parents. NTD's Daniel Monahan speaks with the National Center for Law and Policy about the case. It all started with a third grade teacher named Daniel Bishop, who reportedly reached out to kids from third to sixth grade at Pleasant Grove Elementary School about a new LGBT club called UBU. Education activist Heidi Moore discusses the club. Parents say kids were told it was for boys who crush on boys and girls who crush on girls. No permission slips were required, and parents say it wasn't put in the monthly newsletter like all other activities. Attorney Dean Broyle says the National Center for Law and Policy submitted a cease and desist letter to the Elk Grove Unified School District late last month. They are demanding the district permanently suspend its UBU and Rainbow Clubs in all district elementary schools. When you have anybody, whether it's an educator or not, talking about highly sensitive and controversial topics regarding human sexuality with young children, and telling them to keep that information from their parents, that's actually potentially grooming behavior. According to Broyles, one of the worst missteps in this case was the secrecy of the club. Information was intentionally kept from parents, and parents were kept in the dark, and it was rolled out because they, the other side believes really that children uh, have sexual rights apart from their parents, and so therefore, um, they should be able to talk to their sexual about their sexuality with teachers. The attorney alleges that covertly starting LGBT clubs and inviting kids without letting their parents know is a common tactic used by groups like the California Teachers Association. Audio from a CTA training session conference in October 2021 called Beyond the Binary, Identity and Imagining Possibilities was leaked to reporter Abigail Schreier. Schreier said on Fox News that one of the worst things she heard was teachers saying they needed to monitor students' Google searches to determine who to invite to LGBT clubs. 
The fact that they were targeting children for these personal invitations to their club um, is, is very concerning and that they were coaching other teachers in the surveillance of students. Parents took their complaints and questions about the UBU club to the Elk Grove Unified School Board at a school board meeting in March. One parent held up a flyer she says the school administration sent to teachers entitled Responding to Resistance. The bullet points mention that teachers will learn, quote, how to respond to resistance against rainbow clubs. Police officer Kyle Dixon says he has witnessed firsthand the dangers of children learning habits of keeping secrets from their parents, saying the story almost always ends tragically. This is a dangerous, divisive tactic that those with nefarious intent often use to exploit children, not protect them. In email communication with parents, Pleasant Grove Elementary School principal Deidre Wood wrote that the club was accidentally left out of the newsletter and would be mentioned in a future newsletter. Wood also said the purpose of the UBU club is to provide a safe, accepting space for students of the LGBT community. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And a major egg and poultry producer is shutting down production at one of its plants due to an outbreak of bird flu. Calmaine Foods announcing today that it's halting operations at its Texas plant after some of the birds tested positive for H1N5, a strain of the highly pathogenic bird flu. More than one and a half million birds and chicks were found to be infected and will have to be killed. The plant closure follows, follows protocols established by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The firm plans to secure eggs and meat from other facilities. And a multi-day severe thunderstorm intensified today, impacting areas from the southeast to the Ohio Valley. It's threatening to unleash powerful tornadoes, damaging winds, and hail as large as golf balls in some areas. Monday, the severe thunderstorms pummeled parts of Texas all the way to Illinois, bringing reports of three tornadoes in Oklahoma. It pelted places with hailstones larger than baseballs. Today, forecasters predict the greatest risk for intense, potentially long-track tornadoes extends from southeast Indiana, across Ohio and other parts of Kentucky, West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Updates on the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israeli forces unintentionally killed aid workers in the Gaza Strip. Unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic incident where our forces unintentionally struck innocent people in the Gaza Strip. It happens in war, and we are thoroughly investigating it. We are in contact with the governments and will do everything to prevent such occurrences in the future. According to World Central Kitchen, an Israeli airstrike killed at least seven of its aid workers on Monday. World Central Kitchen is a U.S.-based group delivering food to civilians in Gaza. The group said the victims included citizens of Australia, Poland, the United Kingdom and a U.S.-Canada dual citizen. The killed workers were traveling in two armored cars when the convoy was hit in central Gaza. The Israeli military said an independent body will open an investigation into the incident and get to the bottom of it. The military offered condolences and promised the investigation will be thorough and transparent. The U.S. says it has been in contact with Israel. Leaders from the UK, Australia and Poland responded to, responded to the news. The victims of yesterday's strike join a record number of humanitarian workers who have been killed in this particular conflict. These people are heroes. They run into the fire, not away from it. They show the best of what humanity has to offer when the going really gets tough shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family. Australia expects full accountability for the deaths of aid workers, uh, which is completely unacceptable. Uh, aid workers and those doing humanitarian work, and indeed all innocent civilians, need to be provided with protection. This is a tragedy. We still do not understand how this could have happened. I would like to express my sincere condolences to the family of our brave volunteer. 
As governments look to regulate new technology like AI, a pair of Western allies have signed a monumental agreement. The U.S. and Britain will work together on how to test and assess risks from emerging AI models. The landmark agreement was signed Monday in Washington. It lays out how the two governments will pool technical knowledge, information and talent on AI safety. It's the first bilateral agreement on AI safety in the world. The partnership is modeled after another agreement between the British Communications Office and the U.S. National Security Agency. When we come back, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on a diplomacy tour of European Union member states to garner support for Ukraine's war with Russia. And a Las Vegas institution for stars like Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. is closed for good. Now the Strip's third oldest casino is being demolished to build a new Major League Baseball stadium. That and more after the break. First time I came in here was Monday, and today is Thursday. I've had two surgeries and am doing fantastic. I'm still in shock that I can walk. That's all within four days. In fourth grade, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. I had 70 and 60 degree curvatures. Went to Shriners Hospital in LA. It's been fused ever since. I noticed a lot of pain going down my left buttock into my thighs and into my calf. I could be standing there and my legs would just go out. I went through pain management for two and a half years and the pain management specialist told me there was nothing more he could do for me. We actually did our own research and next thing I know, Dr. Benati called and he told me immediately over the phone what my issue was without even seeing me. I was in a twilight stage during surgery and you can actually say, where are you feeling that pain? And it immediately stops. Hold the leg up there. No pain here. No, no pain here. No. no pain on the butt. No. All of a sudden, they're all, do you want to get up and walk? Well, I couldn't walk before, and I got up, and I just started crying because I had no pain, and I had all my weight on my left leg and on my right leg, and I walked a straight line with no assistance, no falling, no grabbing onto the walls, nothing. I held my own weight, and that's the first time in months that I was able to walk by myself. Benati succeeds where others fail. For more stories like these and the rest of our program, check out American Medicine Today, featuring cutting-edge medical and science innovators and a medical professional's insight on political and social issues plaguing our nation and healthcare. American Medicine Today, Saturdays 6 and Sundays at 9 on NTD Television and other streaming platforms. I was born into the wrong body. Mom. I was astounded by what they were teaching. Child Protective Services did show up at my house. Parents are fearful of losing custody of their children because they say the wrong thing. Risks? No, no risks. Uh, we got everything covered in short Mrs. Connor. They don't want anyone to know the truth. I can't stay quiet about this anymore. It's destroyed my health. We're pushed into silence. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken embarks on a diplomatic tour of Europe this week. His goal is to bolster collaboration to support Ukraine amid other issues. NTD's France correspondent David Vives has more. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited a howitzer's Canaan factory near Versailles today. A first stop on his European tour that marks a key milestone in the Biden's administration diplomacy efforts toward Europe, as it underscores the collaborative work between France and the United States in support of Ukraine. During his visit, Blinken emphasizes the pressing need for expedited U.S. military aid, echoing President Biden's call to Congress for swift action. The supplementary budget request that President Biden has made to Congress must be fulfilled as quickly as possible. 
um, it's needed now. It's needed urgently. Blinken's journey extends to Brussels for a NATO ministerial meeting this Thursday. The gathering will address regional security concerns, including the situation in Ukraine and the support provided by the EU member states. However, according to the member of European Parliament, Marcel de Graaf, EU member states have widely divergent stances on the help to Ukraine. He also said many members of EU Parliament are against it. They're also against this um, um, EU army and this ever, ever uh, uh, more ambitious um, EU initiatives, mm -hmm. which, which in the end um, is all a fight about who will get the biggest share from this EU fund uh, to sponsor their own industry. So it's this, it's, it's all about the money, follow the money and you'll see what happens. While Ukraine will be high on the agenda on the Secretary's tour, events in the Middle East are likely to take center stage. David Ives, NTD News, Paris. In a school shooting in Finland today, a 12-year-old shot and wounded three other students. Police say one was killed and the two others are at the hospital. They also say they took the suspect into custody after the student fled by foot. The country's public broadcaster reports the handgun was licensed to a close relative of the shooter. The school is in a suburb of Helsinki. It has almost 900 students and staff. And Google settles a multi-billion dollar privacy suit lawsuit. Here's NTD's Don Ma with today's business brief. Thank you, Steph. So it seems like Google is going to delete billions of user browsing records to settle a $5 billion privacy lawsuit. The tech giant will also switch off third-party trackers by default and notify users when their data is being collected. Now, in the past, Google used third-party cookies to collect user data even when users were on non-Google sites. The 2020 lawsuit centered on Google's incognito mode, and plaintiffs accused Google of collecting millions of users' uh, data without their knowledge while they were using incognito mode. Google says uh, the data it collected was technical in nature and was never associated with any individual and was never used for any form of personalization. In other news, as China tries to win back foreign investors, I want to talk about a major risk and is hiding in plain sight that many don't know about, and that is an exit ban. This is a legal tool that can trap foreigners in China. A, a person hit with an exit ban doesn't have to be even accused of a crime and likely doesn't even know about it until he or she tries to leave. An exit ban can be issued on, on someone involved in a civil case, for example, often in a business dispute. The Wall Street Journal found at least 37 cases of foreign nationals slapped with exit bans. And that includes an Iranian businessman who was stuck for months simply because he owed an employee $7,000. Investigators have found more than 150 exit ban cases. Anyone under an exit ban has their name added to a national database, which is checked at all airports and train stations. A legal expert says that there really isn't actually anything that can be done about an exit ban because it is legal in China. That's all from me and back to you, Steph. Great, thanks, Don. And a new report says you need a six-figure income to afford a typical home in nearly half of the United States. To hear more from Don about this, tune in to NTD's new show, Business Matters, at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. And next up, a Las Vegas landmark, once the playground of stars like Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr., will be replaced by a major league baseball park, the Tropicana, the Strip's third oldest casino, which opened in April 1957, is now gone for good. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the latest. Even amid the boom in the Las Vegas Strip mega resorts, the Tropicana remained a landmark for its vintage Vegas lore. The casino even became a pop culture reference in movies and TV shows. When they started, the new places started coming in, Tropicana kind of, you know, but everybody liked the new place. But the Tropicana was always a, a classic hotel. It was a Tiffany of the Strip. Everybody wanted to come work at Tropicana. And I hate to see it go, but uh, it's just come to that time that it has to happen. Yeah. But it's sad, and I'm, you know, you're going to miss the people because we're like family, so. Demolition is slated for October to make room for a $1.5 billion Major League Baseball stadium. 
The venue will be the new home for the Oakland Athletics after the team relocates to Las Vegas. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Thank you for watching NTD Newsroom. I'm Stephanie Cox. We'll have more stories from the U.S. and around the world. Join Tiffany Meyer for the NTD Evening News at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific.